Hello everyone, welcome to my channel and yet another lore video. Just a small announcement before it starts. I know that many of you are excited about this series and eagerly awaiting every new release. The last Siege Frags video was already three months ago and I agree it's about time for a new one. The thing is, research, writing the script and doing all these animations for these takes a really long time. Considering the insane amount of hours I put into this, it is only made possible because of my supporters. I'm literally making more than 10 hour workdays every day just to make this happen. So if you feel like you want to help out the channel and keep these animated 40k series coming, please consider your own support. There are several ways to do it. You can become a supporter on Patreon and this will bring a few perks, but you can also become a YouTube member or support me on Ko-Fi. Whatever suits you the best. Thanks for listening, now let's get on with the show. Upon the ravaged surface of Vrax, the 88th Imperial Siege Army finally found themselves replenished enough to continue their assault against the inner Vraxian defensive line. Their artillery had already begun the task of softening up the enemy defenses with their bombardments. During Lord Commander Jolka's big push against the second defensive line, they had endured crippling losses and exhausted the majority of their equipment. Although they had eventually managed to achieve a successful breakthrough, the astronomical cost of the offensive left many wondering if it had been worthwhile. Over time, they had managed to regain much of their original forces, but the new influx of troops were predominantly fresh recruits. The millions of veteran Death Corps soldiers, whose corpses were now strewn across the Van Meersland wastes, would be difficult to replace. At the start of the siege more than ten years ago, they had predicted it to be bloody, but at least expected it to be a manageable affair. The nature of the siege seemed perfectly suited for a traditional commander like Julka. The steadfast Death Corps of Krieg had been selected as the ideal military force to methodically crush the enemy's vast amount of static defenses into dust. But over the last couple of years, this illusion had been completely shattered. So far, the battle for Vrax had been far from predictable. Defying all expectations, the ragtag army of defenders had valiantly faced the Imperial onslaught on every front and even managed several large-scale counterattacks. And even by the Death Corps standards, they had caused the 88th Siege Army to suffer a horrifically high death toll. Several Space Marines chapters had made an appearance on Vrax as well, causing nothing but trouble and further complications. And due to the immense drain of manpower, the Departmento Munitorum was considering sending less and less reinforcements into the meat grinder that Vrax had turned into. Lord Commander Julka had tried everything he could to continue the siege and save his career. He had exercised all of the standard siege doctrines he had studied during his time in the military academy. He had even leveraged his influential relationships to receive more reinforcements and weapons. Although this had helped him to eventually achieve a breakthrough of the second defensive line, ultimately it had not been enough to completely crush the Vraxian resistance. And so, despite their best efforts, they were several years behind their original schedule. While the reinforcements were slowly trickling in, the 88th Siege Army did not sit idly by. They had spent the time digging deep trench networks and constructing bunker complexes in front of the Vraxian lines in order to prepare for the next phase of the siege. As comfortable as these new trenches were, sooner or later the troops would have to climb their ladders and move out into no man's land again. Seeing as High Command could no longer afford their usual tactic of frontal human wave attacks, they had spent a significant amount of effort on mapping the enemy fortifications, hoping to gain a tactical advantage. But whenever new reconnaissance reports of the terrain came in, the situation looked even worse than before. On paper, the inner defensive line had appeared similar to the other two. But in reality, over the duration of the siege, the defenders had turned the area into a thick defensive kill zone of up to 20 kilometers deep. In some places, it even covered the entire distance all the way up to the citadel itself. This much stronger and better equipped final defensive zone would prove vastly more difficult to break than anything they had faced before. Even by a conservative estimation, 
It would take at least another decade and the lives of several million more guardsmen to achieve a real breakthrough. Even Lord Commander Julka, who had his headquarters comfortably stationed far away on Thracian Primaris, had to admit that the situation on Vrax, as well as the future of his military career, looked very grim indeed. But little did he nor the troops in the trenches realize that all of it was about to go from bad to worse. The high sulfuric density in Vrax's atmosphere regularly resulted in heavy thunderstorms. The weather forecasts for the planned assault on Sector 55-47 against a bunker complex on Mortuary Ridge did not look promising. But despite the predictions for heavy rain, Captain Fyodor and his men of the 468th Regiment were ordered to start their offensive regardless. Due to the unfortunate terrain, their current front line was quite vulnerable. But if they attacked now with the help of the artillery, they might just be able to move the front lines forward and improve their position before the cloud break happened. And if they could manage to at least capture Fort C-585, they would have a well-defensible stronghold to stand their ground against the inevitable counterattacks. The sticky mud that would result from the rainstorm would hopefully make it difficult for the Vraxians to organize an effective assault to recapture the fort. The relatively newly arrived 46th Line Corps had of course also been part of Zhulka's monumental big push, but their fresh regiments still had something to prove. As modest as the anticipated gains for the assault against Mortuary Ridge would be, it would at least be something. They were eager to prove their combat prowess. Rain or no rain, they would push on. And so as the artillery opened up their barrage, five companies under Captain Fodor's leadership, accompanied by several Macarius heavy tanks and Lehman Russells, moved out of their trenches. Over a four kilometer wide front, they made their way up the steep slopes of the ridge. Although the troops managed to get quite close to the enemy bunkers, all along the line, the attack started to bog down under heavy fire. Many of their tanks had in fact already been immobilized by anti-tank mines. Unable to move forward, they simply continued to fire their turrets into the bunkers, until well-aimed Vraxian artillery strikes would bring an end to them. But one of the Macarius heavy tanks managed to get through unscathed and now spearheaded the attack on Fort C-585. Supported by infantry, it finally got to the top of the ridge, where its heavy weapons caused havoc amongst the defenders. With well-aimed grenades and lasgun fire, the troops started to methodically clear out the defenders. The Vraxians realized their position was about to be overrun, so they called up their reserve infantry from the rear of their line. A large wave of Vraxian militia infantry rushed over the terrain up to the front line. As the counterattack charged into the battle, it turned into a bloody melee. Shovels, axes, sabers, and bayonets hacked and sliced at each other in a brutal hand-to-hand -hand combat. But through their discipline and unwavering resolve, the Death Corps weathered the frenzied mob of militia forces and even managed to regain the upper hand in the fighting. They had come close to their objective of capturing Fort C-585. Now was the time for Captain Fodor to call in his own reserve companies and decisively win the battle. Back from their own lines, two companies fixed bayonets and got out of their trenches. A grey mass of greatcoats and sharp steel stormed their way up the ridge. This tidal wave of fresh Death Corps soldiers relentlessly bore down upon the Vraxians' counterattack. The onslaught of their advance was overwhelming and swiftly broke the enemy's morale. Regarding the Vraxians, whoever managed to survive the bayonet charge fled back in panic towards their own rear lines. The captain and his men quickly cleared out the few remaining defenders in the bunkers with grenades and flamethrowers. During the last moments of the battle, Fodor was wounded as a bullet struck his lower arm, but that was but a small price to pay for the glory that was now his. The 468th Regiment had managed their objective. The capture of Fort C-585 had not come a moment too soon. The darkened clouds broke and a heavy rainstorm poured down on the troops. The slopes of Mortuary Ridge turned into slippery, muddy torrents, with next to no grip. In their hasty retreat, many Vraxians were swept off their feet or even got stuck in the sludge. As the extreme weather prevented the Death Corps from pursuing their foes, they simply raised their lasguns and picked off the stragglers who had not managed to escape through the mud in time. The weather had made any attacks on the steep slopes practically impossible, 
Unsuccessful assaults further along the line were ordered to halt their advance and make their way to Fort C-585 instead. Here, they would regroup and hunker down in order to prepare themselves for the Vraxian counterattack that would certainly come once the weather had calmed down. But before they had time to recover from the battle, to their surprise a devastating orbital bombardment began. They had not been informed that while the attack on Mortuary Ridge was taking place, the Chaos Armada had successfully defeated the Imperial Navy above Vrax. The 88th Siege Army had no weapons to fend off the enemy ships in lower orbit, and so the traitorous fleet had free reign to turn their weapons towards the surface to deliver their payloads. From a distance, Captain Fodor and his men witnessed the orbital bombardment target the trench lines where their own assault had begun earlier that day. The Chaos battleships launched battery salvos plowed the surface and blasted scorched craters where the rock turned to blackened glass from the extreme heat. Their macro cannons pulverized entire dugouts and bunkers with a single hit. Even on the mortuary ridge, they could feel the blast waves of the distant bombardment. But that was not all, because when the bombardment lifted, Hundreds of Dreadclaw drop pods made their way down towards the surface. With little in the way of anti-air defenses, there was nothing that could be done to stop them. Filled to the brim with bloodthirsty Astartes, they landed with great impact amongst the Death Corps trenches. Among them were warbands of Skull Takers, World Eaters, and Berserkers of Scalathrax. Once deployed, the Chaos Space Marines rampaged through the lines, slaughtering any unfortunate guardsmen they could get their hands on. It wasn't long before the traitors realized most of the Death Corps soldiers were in fact not in their trenches but stationed on the ridgeline, and so a second wave of Dreadclaw drop pods were launched and rained down directly on Fort C-585. With great impacts, the drop pods crashed into the soil, disembarking their cargo of frenzied traitor legionaries. The hatches of the few remaining tanks were ripped open by powered armored hands, pulling out the screaming crew and slaughtering them one by one. Fodor's troops hunkered down inside the captured bunkers and aimed their mouth of weapons at the reinforced doors. The first enemies who barged inside were greeted by a vaporizing blast wave to the face that instantly stopped the heretical superhuman in their tracks. But despite killing several of them, the Death Corps didn't stand a chance against the traitorous onslaught. The enraged Astartes continued to rush inside from all directions, barely inconvenienced by the shots of lasgun fire aimed at them. In the narrow confines of the bunkers, there was nowhere to run or hide from the roaring chain axes of the berserkers, and soon the floors of the bunkers were soaked with imperial blood. Captain Fodor met his end when he was decapitated. His severed head was added to the pile of corpses as the Chaos Marines went looking for more victims of their carnage. With rampaging Chaos Marines behind and within their lines, the forces of the 88th Siege Army were in total disorder. There was no way to keep track of the fast-moving elite enemy forces. It seemed as if they had simply appeared wherever and whenever they pleased. They would strike at the front lines, then target an ammunition depot or an artillery position in the rear. Next, a bunker in the communication trenches would get wiped out, cutting their communications. Most of their weapons were unable to penetrate the power armor. Only the scarce heavy weapon teams had any chance of taking them down, but these proved difficult to deploy in the utter turmoil. The only respite that the 88th Siege Army could enjoy was that the traitor Astartes had little intention of capturing and holding any ground. The individual warbands seemed more interested in outcompeting each other in terms of havoc and slaughter, in order to gain the favor of their dark gods. And so, when a frenzied warband had rampaged through an area, what was left of the Imperial troops could once again regroup and attempt to secure the area. Encouraged by these unholy reinforcements, the Vraxians tried their luck against the Death Corps trenches as well. In a lot of places, the extensive digging would now pay off, and the 88th Siege Army was able to fend off the attacks. While in others, especially areas where the traitor marines had struck the hardest, they were simply too undermanned to stop the advancing enemy. What had once been a continuous surrounding trench network around the inner defensive line had now been turned into large pockets of resistance. But that was not all. With the Imperial Navy routed from the system by the Chaos Armada, their supply lines from space were cut off. For now, the initial landing zones on the Saratama Plains were still plenty stockpiled, but if nothing was done to re-establish naval control over the system, they would eventually run out of supplies. The Death Corps are unwavering combatants willing to fight to the last man, 
but even they require weapons and ammunition. High Command would have to work overtime if they were to have any hope of salvaging the extremely dire situation. But it was clear that Julka was not the man for this job. News of the impending failure reached Lord Commander Militant of Segmentum Obscurus, who started an investigation to figure out how it was possible that despite the vast amount of Imperial troops sent to Vrax, the siege had still gone so horribly wrong. If Julka were to be found lacking in his duties as commander, he would be punished for these failures. But mere disciplinary action against High Command would do little for the Death Corps soldiers facing annihilation on the battlefield right now. Although a new commander for the 88th Siege Army would have to be found in due time, something more would have to be done right now in order to avert a complete disaster. As much as had already been invested into the siege, and as completely hopeless as the endless meat grinder appeared, they couldn't abandon an entire army to a fate of guaranteed defeat. But before help would be able to arrive, the Death Corps would be on their own to face an even bigger threat. Reports came in that Aaron's Bane had survived its crash landing on the planet and was disembarking its troops onto the Chalia Plateau. The vast majority of its cargo had been damaged or killed in the impact, but what had remained was still a considerable force to be reckoned with. Not least because several titans of Legio Vulcanum had successfully managed to disembark the wreckage and now prepared to walk onto the front lines. The traitor legions and a huge ragtag band of renegades composed of both vehicles and a large mob of infantry on foot had 160 kilometers of terrain to cover before they would be able to join the battle. But their lust for battle after their long voyage from the Eye of Terror towards Vrax drove them forward with great haste. Meanwhile, the 88th Siege Army was scrambling to properly organize defensive maneuvers. Through their magnoculars, local command units could already observe the faint glimmer of enemy titans visible on the horizon. The Horde had already bypassed the Mora Gorge and advanced straight towards the rear of the Death Corps lines. It would be up to the 101st Siege Regiment and the tanks of the 11th Assault Corps to deal with the Chaos Horde. If they could delay the onslaught, the rest of the 1st Line Corps would have a chance to rendezvous with the 30th Line Corps to their west and escape the potential encirclement. If they failed to stop the approach, a large part of the 88th Siege Army would be trapped, with their backs towards a deep ravine called the Denris Trench. With everything that had already gone wrong thus far, such a catastrophic loss could not be allowed to happen. A large part of the Chaos Infantry halted near the abandoned second defensive line to rest after their long march, but the god machines and mechanized troops continued their tireless advance across the wasteland, eager to deliver battle. Determined to intercept their enemy and buy time for the rest of the army to get out, their Macarius and Lehman Rust tanks rolled forward. The brave crews of the 11th Assault Corps prepared for a suicidal engagement against the titans of Legio Vulcanum.